Okay, here we go. John Reed, SAP Tech Head, Las Vegas, the annual show review. But it's not Dick Hirsch. <laughs> <laughs> it's an equally special guest. Oh, the outs- nicely played. The <laughs> and, and Dick, we're thinking about you, man. You just he's just not here. Um, but but I've got a good one here. I've got Graham Robinson. How are we doing? I'm going well, John. How are you? Good. Or Graham Robo, as they say on Twitter. That's right. Yeah. Let's see. So so many things about you we could mention. Uh, <laughs> Long time SAP mentor. Yeah. From yeah. the outback. From the outback, yes, from the other end of the world. Came a long way for these proceedings. I did, yeah, and I, I got actually got here via Germany as well. So I, I, I got to tell you, I'm really looking forward to going home. Yeah, yeah. We just <laughs> ran into your wife. She's done with Vegas, also. She's she was done from Vegas with yeah. Vegas for the moment we drove in. Sounds like she was efficiently <laughs> made use of the experience, and now she's done. Yeah, I think I think maybe the Vegas she wore off because I think she might have enjoyed it more last time. But that's what happens. Yes, so. absolutely. Yep. Okay. And other things. You're you're an avid abopper. Yeah, I like I like uh, I like what ABAP brings to the enterprise world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and you've done it on your own independently as far as your business is concerned, which is very interesting because there's not that many people in the SAP ecosystem that work directly with customers selling their own stuff, which is really cool. And you, yeah. you have one thing in particular, right, that you've been sort of selling to customers? Yeah, well, I guess for me, um, I, I went out on my own more than 15 years ago now, and, and the gap I saw was the internet, internet enablement gap at SAP. Yeah. If you think back in the early 2000s, you know, right. it's taken a long time for SAP to discover the internet, um, you right. know, which, ha- which happened sort of five or six years ago. So I spent a lot of time building um, web UIs on SAP and things like that, and, and the particular um, software as a service offering I've had out there for about six or eight years is a workflow approval app that again uses internet technologies to to make that pretty easy and uh, and get around that particular problem yeah nice so that though I think those vantage points are important because one of the things I like about talking to you is because uh, it may be a little bit unfair sometimes but to me to really judge the success of SAP from a sort of technical direction I want to see folks like yourself feel included and a part of things, because if they can make it possible for you to contribute, not only are they making it, we know they're lowering the barriers to entry, but they're also bringing in a lot of fresh ideas from individuals who are more unfettered, shall we say, and and perhaps more creative and, and, and have more room to play than a lot of people that are working in larger companies. So that's one interesting thing about always getting back to someone like yourself is see if this passes your sense test or not, right? Yeah, that, that's right. And and, yeah. and and it covers the entire SAP um, um, touch points. For example, uh, for, for me as an individual developer, I would like to be an SAP partner, but it's only recently that I've I've really found ways to do that without having to stump up a whole lot of cash. And SAP are trying to make that happen at scale, so so individuals, almost individual developers like myself, can be part of their partner ecosystem in a in a a, as first class citizens, which has always been a a problem. Unfortunately, the one group we can't speak for are an important group for SAP, which are younger developers in open source communities. Brian Dennett, who was part of the group that, you, that we were in this year, meeting with executives as part of the blogger program via Stacey Fish, who did an awesome job, by the way. Uh, he was push pressing some of those issues. That's the one group we can't really represent. And they're not really in Vegas, let's face it. They don't come to Vegas to learn about SAP. If SAP wants to connect with those people, they, I think they have done it to, to a small extent through their own on the ground at events where those developers are. They're not coming to Vegas. <laughs> So. Yeah, I think even SAP would admit themselves that they they haven't got that right yet. There's, yeah. there's lots more to it, and there always will be, right? For that yeah. sort of constituency, it's going to be forever changing. For There's ever going to be different ways to engage with them, to keep their attention, all that sort of stuff. Right. And and, and I think the other sort of backdrop that's, that's important to sort of set here is that SAP TechEd itself is, is in an interesting spot because you kind of judge um, – SAP TechEd is a way of getting a handle on how SAP is doing with community because SAP TechEd was always like a, a very deep community event. Yeah. And community SAP has gone through a lot of a lot of difficult challenges and transitions, let's face it. Yep. Um, and we could say probably some pretty critical things, for example, of how the online piece has been handled over a number of years, the, the problems with logging into the website and, and managing your credentials across SAP properties or the stuff of legend at this point. But but there's all, but the more important thing is sort of the vibe and the, and, and, and the community feeling on the ground at, at such events. And so that's another piece of it is to kind of 
get a sense of that. And there's a lot of new leadership in play now, including from the mentor on the mentor side. So that's another sort of theme that I think we're playing out here. Yeah. And I think uh, what we saw this week was, was a bit of a, a restart, a reinvigoration of that stuff. Certainly a recognition that more needed to happen at this event to, to sort of um, raise the profile and put community front and centre. Um, they acknowledge and they know there's more to be done, but um, the community stuff had a prominent place on the show floor. It was a it was an area big enough for people just to come by and find some lounges and sit down and chat right. and do things like that. Um, it uh, it was a place that people wanted to go to because that's what community is about, right? Um, I think uh, I think and I know that they there's more to be done. You know, I, you know, bringing bringing the legendary Marilyn Pratt along to, to right. for the week and get her involved is a great way to 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 continue those links with the past and the things that worked. But they're doing it in a way where they recognise they've got to evolve and go forward as well. So uh, so it, uh, I'm looking forward to see how it goes as it progresses. Yeah, and and part of that comes from uh, folks like Thomas Grassel who uh, has been involved in developer relations for a long time, but is more of a quote unquote executive now. So he has more like oversight of this stuff. And then Craig Schmahill, yeah. Craig Schmahill, who's been involved in community in various ways at SAP for a long time. Um, and, and has now come back in, in, in kind of a community influencer management role. What I told Craig and what I also have told SAP leadership is it's really going to take another year to, to really evaluate what they've accomplished there versus what they have in the past. And, and there's definitely debates around some of the things they're doing. But, uh, but there was definitely a little more vitality, I think. You could feel a little more of the, the pulse of community yeah. here again, which was, which was really and, nice And to some see. of that was those debates where people are, are tossing up ideas about what's happening and agreeing yeah. and disagreeing. And, you know, that's, that's what community is as well, right? You know, community is not about all agreeing. No, and, and, and for anyone who wonders like why we deviated into this topic so quickly, it's because I happen to believe that, that, that community, a healthy community is sort of at the core of, of what a modern software company needs to succeed. I don't think it's like a nice to have at all. No, not at all. Um, not so, at all. But that's a longer discussion probably. Uh, so we have several news items I want to get to in particular, the, the GA, the general availability of uh, up on uh, the SAP Cloud Platform, uh, out the Albot passes as calls. So I want to get to that, but before we do that, um, you had like a whirlwind series of meetings put together by Stacy, and then you had so a lot of free time to kind of get into trouble yourself. <laughs> uh, so, were so, there any were there any highlights or or lowlights from from your explorations this week? Or? Um, I I I I'm surprised by how enthusiastic and generally positively the um, the SAP ecosystem has taken the ABAP in the cloud type stuff to give it its proper name, the SAP Cloud Platform ABAP environment. Right. Um, I I it's I mean it, it there was spontaneous applause at the at at the keynote when it was announced it had gone GA. I don't know if you remember, but last year there was spontaneous applause when it was announced that they were going to do it. Um, right. I went to. Uh, a, a presentation that Carl Kessler did, the product manager for, for the ABAP platform, and it was standing room only, chock-a-block, and it was the second time he'd run it. I, did, I, don't, mm. I assume it was the same earlier in the week as well. Really, really strong interest and positive interest as well, which um, g given that it's only just gone GA, given that at the moment most ABAPers can't even see it and touch it and play with it because they're right. still working on, on trials and finding ways to do that, um, I was uh, I was surprised that it was from a group of grumpy developers. There was so little sort of um, cynicism about it. I guess. Yeah, and and if you look at the comment thread uh, on it on the SAP Community Network for a couple of the announcement blogs, the 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 sort of prohibitive cost for individuals is one of the first things that comes up, as well as the lack of a trial. Uh, we did bring those issues up with SAP leadership, and it does seem to me, based on the responses we got this week, that they're going to work to address some of that, especially in terms of offering trials. Because a couple of the blog posts mentioned that the performance requirements are pretty intensive, and the, the folks we talked to were like, look, we can do this. We've offered other things on trial, on a trial basis that had performance uh, challenges we had to address, and so they feel they can do it. Uh, so that's going to need to happen. Um, but but just to step back a little bit, what do you see as the significance of this announcement? Like, why why was there this type of reaction? Why does this matter to customers? Well, I th think there's a couple of aspects to that. The first and most obvious one is that there's a, a large cohort of ABAP developers who 
in their mind, didn't have a future. Their, in their mind, ABAP was going nowhere because SAP was going to the cloud and they weren't taking ABAP with it. So, so suddenly these people see that there's a roadmap, see that there's a, car- a career progression almost stuff, if you like, happening mm-hmm. for them. So I think that was part of that spontaneous response from the audience was related to that. But for me personally, and being fortunate enough to have a look at what they're doing and things like that, I, uh, I, I think SAP forgot about ABAP for a while. In the early 2000s, mm-hmm. they got a bit focused on, on, especially on the Java work that they were doing and things like that. And they, they literally didn't enhance the ABAP language at all for, for, I would say, at least half a decade. And then since then, when they've got back and looked at it, they've done... Uh, things to enhance the syntax and make it more modern and streamlined to do things, but they haven't really built more functionality into the language. So they've, all they've done mm. is sort of changed the way syntactically things happened. What I'm seeing now, and, and I, I can see an early view of it with the cloud platform stuff, is that they are doing actively enhancing the tools and most importantly, enhancing the language. They're making the language be able to do more things, better things, where in the past, these things had to be frameworks um, that were, would... In some cases, you would use a wizard and generate a whole lot of framework code, which is, um, in my opinion, not necessarily the best way to get most efficient, better code. So, so what I'm seeing is a renewed interest in enhancing and, and improving and modernising that language to bring it into this, this uh, century, which is, which is fantastic. As an Abbott fan, brilliant. Right. And, and you look at it from the vantage point of both individual ABAP developers, but also SAP customers who who rightfully invested heavily, some of the large ones in, in big ABAP teams, and yeah. they're wondering, you know, what is the relevance of these individuals? And so you can certainly see, you know, why SAP felt and pressure to do SAP this. SAP have the same investment, right? So yeah. so they, they've got um, big skin in the game for this as well. And I do have a criticism for SAP about this, and, and this uh, is is both this was reflected in the keynote which i also i already wrote about this part uh, but also in a couple of the blog posts i saw from sap employees about this i didn't feel there was nearly enough recognition given to the community for their role in making this happen and i I just want to put that out there right now that i think it's really important and i and it's really a shame that they didn't bring some of these folks on stage i know you were in waldorf with other sap mentors recently meeting with that team but that was hardly the first meeting or dialogue uh, that, that happened. Now, the one thing I do want to say in SAP's credit is that they did work with the community on this. And and so they, they did do it. They absolutely did. But why not kind of have a shared uh, victory well, lap? I think yeah, that would have been nice. It's, it, it's an interesting story. So for me, it's uh, so that those Waldorf meetings and a few things around those actually came from um, from us providing some unsolicited feedback. And it's the first time I've ever provided SAP with feedback on a product they hadn't released yet. Right. So I was providing feedback, um, and not just me, there was a group of us providing some feedback um, based upon rumour and innuendo and even gossip about what this thing might be. So our feedback had necessarily had to be very strategic and very, uh, very nuanced because we actually hadn't seen this thing at all. So... Um, so I think that made it a new thing for SAP as well, right? Because the SAP are used to releasing a product and then waiting to see what the feedback is, right? Whereas we were getting in there early to do that. So I think it. Uh, I think you're right, but I think that that was a new type of engagement. It was a new way of doing it. And, and look, I mean, despite my criticism of it, ultimately, you know, kudos to SAP for for Absolutely. doing it that way. And and I talked with someone who was pretty heavily involved in the dialogue, and they said that at first. The conversations were a little, as he was a little resistant around some of the feedback, but that eventually they really heard the feedback and really incorporated that into what they were doing. And the other community piece I just wanted to mention there is that ABAP Git plays a role in in the in the final product release. Absolutely. There's an important piece of that, and that could probably be pretty technical to get into exactly what the, how that fits in. But ABAP Git was a community project. Um, Absolutely, and still is, and done by some real. But SAP are now a contributor to that project, you know, which right. was it took a while to get for us to get them there. Yeah, but they are now an active contributor to that project. It, it's as you say, it's a, it's an integral part of the uh, of the ABAP. Um, initially, the ABAP in the cloud story, but it's for ABAP is everywhere on prem and everywhere. It's a, and it's a it's a change in developer mindset and workflow uh, that that will take. ABAP has and it has taken SAP a while to get their head around it. Right. And there's a ton of SAP mentors and, and ABAP geeks that have participated and spoken out. So I don't want to single out any one person too much, but I have heard repeatedly 
that that an individual a hardcore ob upper named Lars Peterson Man. has done some really heavy lifting on the ob up gip side. And 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 to someone like Lars, that should be an inspirational thing, right? You put Absolutely. in that time, and it actually is impacting the future of SAP. So kudos to folks like Lars who yep. who did that on faith, and it actually paid off. Yeah, and and what Lars has also done is he's shown ab uppers that there you can do open source ab app development. You can. Uh, you know, he, he hasn't just initiated that one project. You know, he's he's got a, a list a mile long of things like that, and he's showing he's showing the ABAP community that you can do open source ABAP development, you can do collaborative development, you can you can share your code and let other people see it and not feel not feel uh, you know threatened by that. You know, because that's what makes you a better developer when you get feedback from other developers, things like that, and that's traditionally been the things that ABAPers haven't been good at doing. Yeah, and I think the. The, the interesting thing from here is, you know, okay, smart move on SAP's part. Um, now what's next? And <clears throat> one of the interesting things that I was digging into was, so um, put aside the, the cost issues and all that stuff. If I have access to this and I'm an old school ob upper, uh, can I now become a, a, uh, an ob up on this? How, like, what is the skills journey for me? Can I start tomorrow and get going? And, the, and you can sort of tell me if I got this right, but, but there, is, there are some changes. Um, so it's not like you can necessarily immediately say, oh, this is exactly what I always did, but in a web environment, there are changes. And one of the big things that folks kept mentioning to me were RESTful services and getting a handle on how to, how to work in a RESTful environment. So that was one big thing. So there is a bit of a, a, a skills journey here. It's a gradual. It, you don't have to become a, a Java, Node.js, or Python person, but there's a journey here. Yeah, there is. And, but it's a journey that uh, our app has, can start now, so so yeah. it, it, so the the sort of changes in development paradigms have been available in the ABAP stack for a long time. You know, writing RESTful services. I mean, that's that's effectively what Gateway is and all that sort of stuff. Okay, it's a framework yeah. to provide that. You can write. We've been able to write them since Netweaver was released in the early two thousands. Right. right. So the you can do it and you can learn that stuff. There just hasn't been the demand and the things to do it. You 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 know, ABAP obj, object oriented ABAP has been around for a long, long, long time, but a lot of people still really haven't made the step to that. Well, if they're going to move into the cloud version of ABAP. Um, it, it's no longer an either or. You know, you're going to have to do things that way. Doesn't, yeah. but, but you don't need to go there first. You can certainly learn the skills now. There's new programming models that are highly documented. There's new ways of doing things. It, it's like any any uh, development environment, development language. It's going to evolve, which is the thing that I referred to before. It's going to evolve, and we, you just got to evolve with it, which is what every other developer on every other language suite does. And in your own world, you you've worked with RESTful services through yeah. prior work on these prior initiatives so you're you're ready to go well yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, and I'm, I'm grateful that i don't have to sort of hand code all the little bits and bytes which is where yeah. we all started right when you started doing that you did really have to code everything now the, as i said the languages have been enhanced a lot of this stuff is built into the language so you don't have to do a lot of the plumbing yourself which goes directly to developer productivity cost of ownership all that stuff as well Right. So so now it, it's going to be interesting to see SAP's next move because I think there's still a lot more they can do with tutorials and, and helping people get started and, and, and getting the word out. I mean, let's face it, some of these folks do need a jolt. <laughs> Yeah, and, and they need, and they need to know that there's stuff out there they can work on. But to your point, there's no excuses not to get started. That's right. Um, there's That's right. plenty you can get going yeah. on today. There's blogs you can read, and there's stuff you can do. Yeah, and so. there's tri the, the trial for the ABAP Cloud stuff is coming hopefully very soon. But but the stuff we're talking about, you can probably do on your own ABAP systems right now. Right. Um, to learn those those techniques and things like that, and and just to touch back to push some onus back on SAP a bit, SAP have really. Um, the first release of the ABAP cloud environment uh, is is very definitely a minimum viable product, right? They're looking for feedback and their own experiences to enhance that, going on those rapid cloud-based um, right. um, innovation cycles. So the onus is on them to push the innovation and expand the capabilities to to take feedback and and show that and show that real benefit of the cloud model, which is we can roll out these innovations really really fast. We don't have to wait for our three to five year on-prem upgrade cycle, right, to get the, to the latest innovations. And, and see, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I've been at recent shows, both SAP shows and non-SAP shows, where stuff has been announced that the vendor's excited about that won't be ready for a year or two at all. And my, my view about this is put something out in GA that is that is not 
everything it's going to be. You, maybe it's not half baked is probably an insult, but it's not ready yet for, mm. for full prime time and all capacity. Put it out there anyway. It yep. doesn't matter. Make it accessible. I think people embrace that concept because now they can work on it and their usage data becomes part of how you improve, which is Absolutely. one of the sort of big arguments for, for cloud in the first place is yep. that you now have that data and along with the feedback that you get. So let's do this, right? And, and, and one of the are. unique capabilities of the ABAP environment in the cloud is, is it is a fully baked ABAP server. They've just used a whitelisting metaphor to, to um, just release certain components of the ABAP stack. So while while the UI technology like DINPRO and that is not available, it's still there. So it actually is a fully functioned, very mature stack. It's just there gradually releasing, adding to the whitelist the things that you can do. Right. And this ties into uh, a, th a theme that I've been sort of working on here is one of my sort of burning questions, so to speak, because I think that in getting back to the keynote, I think one thing SAP and Burnt Likert's keynote here, they did do, the keynote was kind of lacking in community spirit and vibe, um, which I, I think they will probably address for the Barcelona keynote that Bjorn Gorka is doing. Uh, but, but the keynote did present a pretty a concise and I think pretty well thought view of the so-called intelligent enterprise. And I think it's important to present a view of the future, and I think SAP has done that. I think they've done it pretty well, and, and I actually think it works better now than when they were kind of talking. We talked with Bjorn Gerke about this in our meeting with him about how, you know, when they when they emphasized Leonardo at, at the Sapphire before last, it was kind of like, what, we're just getting handled as for HANA, and now you're bringing in this whole other world. And the intelligent enterprise concept, the thing that works well about that is that it sort of brings it all into one framework. Um, yeah, and and it all when you when you look at sort of demands of modern business, like I think that to me, and you may disagree, but I think that in general that vision makes sense. the The problem and the challenge that I have is that if you're not an S4 HANA and live in production on S4 HANA, <laughs> then you, then some of this doesn't apply to you, and the question becomes how much of it doesn't apply to you. Yeah. And to what extent can you get started now with cool stuff, yeah. you know? And, and I think you're, what you offer companies is one example of that you don't have to be NS4 HANA to partake. But what is your thought in terms of that type of stuff? So, so, so for me, uh, as, a, as a techie, one of the things that got my eyes a little wider in the keynote demos was when they did go to the API hub and browse through and find an API to use. The, API, the list of the APIs in the API hub wasn't the half dozen dozen that we've seen before right it's it's in the thousands right and growing so they use open api technology so we can potentially consume them from anywhere now sure some of them are unique to s4 hana and they really about being able to call your own s4 hana instance and it's not going to work there but there are lots of things over there and there's going to be more business services that um, there's no reason any um, other application couldn't call and it doesn't even have to be an sap one but it, you know in our world, it could be an on-premise, old-school ERP system where we want to call one of these business services to add some value around what we want to what we want to do. It might be something like tax calculation. It might be something like uh, you know um, um, validating addresses and vendor details and things like that. Um, it might be something as simple as that where we can improve the process. So that because they're using open APIs, we can leverage them now. Um, it's a question, as you rightly say, of figuring out. Um, how easy is it is and which ones can we and can't we use and how do we decide that? But it, just because we're, we're on an old stack or a different stack or a non-SAP stack, it doesn't mean you can't call these APIs. That's the whole point of them, right? Right. And so I think SAP has made some progress in that regard. I don't think those, those messages weren't really communicated on the keynote stage, no. but, but the way I kind of look at that is that the keynote's not the only thing that I'm going to judge SAP by. I want to see what what the customer sentiment is and what, what people have access to and what they don't. And I think there are still plenty of questions around the S4 HANA roadmap. And I, I think in particular, SAP is really going to have to bear down on business cases uh, to justify moving moving to S4 at this point, because I think a lot of the the folks that moved already had particular pain <laughs> around their their old installations that, that S4 could potentially yeah. solve. That's not the same as as building a business case when you're running pretty well now. That's right. On an older release, and it's, a, it's a big thing to digest, right? You know, if you're if you're going from non HANA as well, non HANA ERP to S4 on HANA, it's a it's quite a leap, and it's a it's a it's a big big project. 
and uh, that'll never change. But once you're there, the story is that those innovation cycles, you can take advantage of them a whole lot quicker and easier. Right. And, and, uh, and then those sort of, you know, IT killing upgrade projects become a thing of the past. Sure. And, that, and I've never, I've always been pretty partial to SAP's vision of the so-called sort of digital core. And, and it makes sense to me. I think my, my biggest criticism about it has been that, it, it goes in contrast to a lot of SaaS vendors, like like take for example Salesforce, where their their notion would be kind of move to the cloud one sort of functional area at a time, and and build on your wins. Yeah. And and it doesn't come off like overhauling the core. In fact, Salesforce might it's argue exactly that not that Salesforce might argue just wrap the core. Yep. And 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 move on right. from the core. Wrap the core, integrate to the core, and move on from the core. We could debate like which is ultimately better. But the point is, SAP needs more answers to folks who just aren't ready for that journey yet, but they also need to help those that need to justify it. And one interesting example I have was a, a nice meeting with Dow Chemical, which I do plan to write about, where they're on an older release and they're using uh, UI5, building mobile apps. Uh, they're primarily for employees um, to fulfill various functions, but, but it's worked very well for them. And, and that's another good example of, of the stories that you can find out there. So I think there's, there's more there. I think SAP could probably emphasize that a little more, but I, I, I did find something. So I'm not necessarily going to say that that was a fail. I think, I think I found some evidence that you can do it. And the ABAP on SAP Cloud Platform is potentially part of that answer now. Yep, so, could be. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's really interesting. So um, Dennis Howlett, meanwhile, uh, who will be going to SAP Tech at Barcelona, if, if any of you want to uh, find him there, uh, he was at uh, a new Relic show called Feature Stack, which was taking place in London right, right before this happened. And <clears throat> it was interesting because he wrote about a, uh, an SAP customer, uh, Lego, that had built um, uh, an app on the SAP Cloud Platform, a customer-facing app. And then they basically spoke out publicly about that the app did not work for them. They were not happy. Uh, I, that's that's probably underestimating it. And and it had to do with like it doesn't SAP can't handle web scale. And so when I think about it um, from a SAP cloud platform perspective, I do think that that's a different scenario than the ones that I look that I've looked at. I've looked at a couple uh, scenarios where 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 the scale was no problem for the folks that used it. So fine. Um, but this. You know, you can imagine Lego operating at a very high scale. That's, absolutely, that's a consumer grade of consumer type grade stuff, you know, expectations, absolutely. and yep. I think that's a different bar, a different type of project. And I haven't had time to investigate this to know how prevalent that is, and I don't know the details for that customer story. That's right. But um, but you had a thought on that 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 another one of the announcements made at this conference could potentially help with that, and that's the uh, the function uh, ERP function as a service, function as a service, absolutely. which is. Uh, I guess you could say serverless ERP in, in a in a small sense, like uh, the notion of serverless technology being you know consume things, really spin it up as you need it to yep. to address issues of scale. So, do you think that something like that could, not knowing any details about yeah. this, it could potentially address something like that? Yeah, or? yeah. I mean, I mean, that's really what the function as a service stuff's all about is to is to help you provide that sort of scale. So, we very, 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 very lightweight little uh, um, endpoints almost that you can hit at, at that sort of you know real web scale and then um, obviously uh, because they're lightweight they can't do all the work as well so uh, decent eventing messaging frameworks between things to do all that sort of stuff it's just is, is a way that you can achieve that um, there's a whole lot of other issues and 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 I think it was Donny picked up the licensing and things like that come around yeah. but, that, but that's the thing but from SAP's point of view um, they're not going to win this game with the technology, it's it's their business knowledge, their enterprise scale knowledge. So, for I would imagine for SAP, if they've got a priority between enterprise grade integrity of the platform and performance of the platform, they're going to favour enterprise grade integrity. That's why you go to SAP. You know, you go to go to some of the other people that are building platforms where you've got to build everything up yourself for that enterprise scale stuff. So, I'm not saying that they wouldn't see that as a priority, and they have to they have to be able to provide that going forward. But right. as they build out their platform, one of their key differentiators is 40 years of running enterprise-grade software. That's that's a really important thing, right, for for large organisations. Where I remember um, when I worked for SAP, my my former MD in Australia, and he 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 um, eventually rose to be on the SAP board. Les Heyman, I remember him in a staff talk 
pointing out that when a company chooses SAP, they are betting the future of their company on SAP. It's a big, big mm-hmm. decision. Um, and uh, SAP are aware of that. They, they build that into their stuff. So, so not as you say, not knowing the example of that particular uh, right. customer. Um, but it, uh, SAP are certainly building out the platform, the functions as a service stuff, some of the Kubernetes announcements, things like that. The Gardner right. stuff is a, an interesting thing because Gardner is, is in, in many respects, providing enterprise um, features to the Kubernetes, managing Kubernetes um, environments and things like that. So um, that's where SAP can really, you know, change the game. Yeah, and and I think the other thing there is it was good to see the SAPs really fleshed out their partnerships with Apple and and Google yeah, and and that was really obvious and Microsoft. On the floor, I mean, last year yep. on the floor it was a little stand. There, that was a big area yeah. and and some really good information and 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 yeah, those those partnerships are really progressing very well. Yeah, I think openness presents dilemmas in it, but but I think SAP is definitely you know embraced that to a large extent now, and we'll see where that takes them. Yeah, and you mentioned Donnie Burkholz because he, when I pushed out the ERP <laughs> functions as service announcement, he said, got to wonder about the purchase pricing model for, for serverless there. Absolutely. And it's a really good question because serverless is not just about on-demand scaling. It's about on-demand pricing. That's right. And uh, and so that's very interesting. And I did pose that question to, to Bjorn Leichhardt and Bjorn during the press and, and also Bjorn Gerger, who was there. They both address that. And, and it's interesting. I think uh, SAP is going to have some challenges there to figure out, you know, how much they can infuse their pricing with with serverless type models and, yep. and how and how that's going to work for customers. Because I think I do believe I believe in on demand pricing for almost everything. But when I talk with customers, I will admit that some of them like predictable yep. <laughs> pricing models. Yep. So I think I've come back off of that a little bit to the point that I think in the ideal software world, customers will be able to choose readily the model that they want, which still poses challenges to a lot of vendors, including cloud vendors that don't operate that way. Um, but but the point being that that um, it was interesting to hear SAP leadership address that point of, of Donnie's, and it's fun to take something from Twitter like that, some snark, right, and, <laughs> that, and, pull, that it, cool. <laughs> and pull it right into a conversation <laughs> in real time. I think yeah. that's that's really good because Donnie when, tweets. John asks a yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Because when you're like, has got to answer it. Because <laughs> we, when you're on the ground at an event, you got a million things going on, and yeah. and someone from somewhere else who's not in your particular, they come from left field, but in this case, with a really important point. Yeah. And and the way SAP leadership addressed that point, they they acknowledged all of that, and what they did say is that f- they are they are definitely looking at 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 serverless pricing models for new stuff. Yeah. But they, they said in general for older stuff, that's not something you're looking at right now, but for newer uh, service oriented apps and stuff that they're looking at that. And so we'll just have to see It's all part of the challenge of moving from on-premise yeah. direct sale into the cloud, right? It's all, all part yeah. of it. So that, that one is, uh, is to be followed. And as far as the web scale thing, what I would say to SAP leadership there is if, if you've made it this far into the podcast, which I think probably a couple of you have, uh, Dennis going to be Dennis Hollick going to be in Barcelona, and you can expect <laughs> him to have a full head of steam on this. So hopefully you will have some good answers for him, or or you won't Settle like the Dennis. results. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so there is that. Um, I have a couple more small things. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to get into? Um, I can't remember what you wrote down before we started talking, John. No, I can't. I can't really either. But <laughs> We've been talking that's too what long. happens. That's what happens. And they're packing like, up the place around us, so it's a bit distracting. Yeah, as well. they are. Yeah, it's funny because it was totally quiet when we sat down, and then, <laughs> but you know that is that is the nature of the live podcast recording. So what can you do? Um, yeah, I I think you know for my part, I think uh, one thing I really appreciated this year. I mean, this is the case every year, but um, just like the the blogger pro- program format that, that Stacy Fish is uh, sort of utilized for us is just really great. Cause like, and the Bjorn Gorka meeting was a great example because yeah. he comes charging in with a head of steam. Uh, <laughs> and there's five of us in the, there's five different bloggers in the room, all from really different perspectives, all in the same meeting. Yep. Um, in fact, we have to be careful not to argue too much amongst ourselves and, and which does happen in these meetings. But, but it's just that, that sort of organic unfacilitated nature of that is really, 
like interesting and, and for he, everyone. And he almost got a retraction from you, John. He did because <laughs> Bjorn had uh, presented compelling evidence. Because in my blog, I had said, I had said, and and I I was actually when I checked it, I, I was a little careful with my language. I didn't say for sure, but I did say that it looked like. Uh, you know, uh, Bert Leichhardt had delivered the only keynote in SAP history that had finished early, and Bjorn Gurke had some compelling evidence that <laughs> he, he actually owned that he title mm. and had been a pioneer in that area. Yeah. And so the blog has now been updated. They actually provided <laughs> me, Bjorn Gurke's team, and Anita Regal, I uh, probably butchered her last name, but that's the case in this morning. Um, she provided me a visual evidence of when the keynote I wonder time where you got those ends. photos from. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those went right into the blog. Uh, so, so it just goes to show you that no blogger is perfect. And, uh, but, but the good humor of that, I think, is is so refreshing. Absolutely. Uh, and to have that kind of dialogue, and, and when you have that kind of dialogue, good things happen. Better content, better conversations, better outcomes for SAP. I think so. Uh, really f huge thumbs up to SAP for how they handle that. So, yeah, no, that's good. And uh, thanks, Stacy. Yeah, no doubt. Well done. And then the, I think the final thing I had was just around customers. I, I had a whole bunch of customer interviews, which is another really smart thing that SAP often does, and they did a great job at this show. Uh, they, the customers were a, a very wide variety, S4 HANA on-prem and cloud and a whole bunch of different mix of agendas, uh, not even just S4. So I can't really tell you like a general insight that I, that I have. But one thing I will say is that most of the customers, even the ones that have good stories, the stories are incomplete in the sense that they're live and they, and they usually have some benefits they can talk about in terms of getting off of, of uh, legacy systems that were expensive or um, uh, cumbersome to, for users, uh, but there's more to do. And, yeah. and most of those stories don't have yet uh, a really clear uh, business benefit. Uh, so you know, as far as like really tangible ROI outcomes, especially when it comes to things that I'm most interested in, in terms of new business models yeah. and, and, and taking, now that you have a single source of the truth, like are you using that data to make better decisions? Are you using, using it for predictive maintenance or other things? But there was one customer and this is another one where, where the name of the customer is just absolutely gonna destroy me. Um, but it's, the, the American name, which I can get away with, is Kaiser Compressors, Inc. <laughs> yep, that'll do. Um, but, but they're selling compressed air as a service, and yep. they're using a lot of SAP technology to do it. They have 300 customers, um, and uh, they're using Data Hub as well. Uh, so uh, to me, it was very interesting to kind of talk to a customer like that who's further down the road. And, and is now kind of working on new business not models. Not exactly a new business, right? They've been around no. for a long, long time with SAP, and, uh, right. and but their business is evolving in amazing ways, really. Well, and that was one of the really cool things. I'm sitting down with this old school German CIO, right? Pretty sure he's German, almost like 99.9%. <laughs> or Austrian. Yeah, or Austrian. <laughs> uh, so whatever it is, <laughs> he's been around SAP for a long, long time. And... Uh, and yet he's on the cutting edge. Yeah. And and I thought that was really, really cool because you're like, wait, this guy, and he's like always been an early adopter and he's always done it. And he had a, a really awesome comment about that when I asked him about, he said, this is physics, action and reaction. If you don't act, then somebody acts on you. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, cool. I mean. The other thing I took from uh, talking to you, I, I wasn't in all those customer meetings, but the other thing I took uh, from from your feedback on those customer meetings is uh, we never need to forget that these IT projects are hard, you know. And yeah. when you're talking to people just at the end of the project, as you say before, they've realised the benefits or been able to do it. They're tired. They're you know they've struggled. They've things like that. They've you know it, it's it's still hard work, and and that's part of the promise of the cloud. Um, and and this clear separation SAP are pushing between the digital core, keep it stable, leave it alone, don't dick with it so we can upgrade it easily and you can get the latest innovations and build the stuff on the side. That's the pain that that's sort of that message is yeah. trying to get rid of and and, uh, and you can see you can see why it would. And, and I would add to that that I think the 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 other thing is that uh, it's and this is something I got into in the podcast I did with Josh Greenbaum on his. Uh, ProQ uh, tool, which is a sort of a product assessment tool that helps helps uh, products to get kind of a gut check before things go off the rails. But one thing that's always been true, but is especially true in a cloud context now, is that go live is just the beginning. Yeah. And 
and and so for for SAP and SAP's partners on these accounts, like they have to see this through to the point where they can really talk about business ROI, and for customers too, because like, it, you know, in, in theory, it sounds really cool. Like, oh, I'm going to get quarterly updates with new functionality, and 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 since I'm on the cloud, I can I can just basically evaluate and put those in without some kind of arduous, yeah. uh, you know, upgrade or whatever service packs or whatever that in the past you had to do. Um, but customers struggle with that too. They yeah. struggle with incorporating new functionality for yep. a variety of reasons. And, and I talked to one customer who's in that situation, who's, who needs more help there from SAP. And, and I think SAP will provide that, but, but, but I think it's just so interesting. And, and my view on that is that that's how it always should have been. It's just that now it needs to be that way because yeah. that's how you earn your money. <laughs> that's right. You know, and if, if customers aren't happy, they have a greater ability than ever before to walk, to cancel subscription or what have you. And, and so uh, I think that's healthy and, uh, and we're seeing signs of it at TechEd. So that's, that's, uh, I think TechEd's going to continue to change. I think in, in some ways, I think I'm speculating a little bit here, but I think this event, as we know it, this big Vegas TechEd, I, I think, there may not be too many more of these. I could be wrong. I would expect SAP to experiment with size and location and different things. Yep. I think they want to get in front of new school developers. And anyway, and I think even the tone of the event may change because the, the event is still more about education on the technical side than it is about developers coming together and building apps. And so anyway, I, I think there's a lot of change still to be had, but yep. we'll see. The one thing we can be sure about is there'll be change. Yeah. All right. Well, any any last words, Scram, or are we good? I'm so looking forward to going home, John. You ready to go? <laughs> you got a you got a massive flight ahead of you, so yeah. I'm wishing you luck there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I got to turn around myself. I'll be in <laughs> going home only to head back to San Fran. So that seems almost counterintuitive to fly east at this point. Anyway, I hope listeners enjoyed that, and uh, I know we had probably a little more noise than than ideal in the background, but. Unfortunately, folks, that's the price of an underground podcast series. I got to grab a space where I can. and uh, But I think these microphones actually shield out some of that background, so it probably is easier on the listeners than it, w than it was on us. It was but, us yeah. yeah. But anyhow, thanks a lot for joining, and until uh, next time. Thanks, John.